In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Welcome everybody to King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. In this important lecture, it is important in terms of the topic and in terms of the speakers uh, about Islamic tolerance, tolerance and diversity. It comes in this time that witnesses the spread of some terroristic and extremist ideas and occurrence from the left and the uh, right aided by the globalized world and the social media means that made it possible for them and easier for them than before in fact if we go back to to history we will find good examples of religious tolerance one of the most important of them is in the first year of hijra the constitution of Medina between Muslims and the Jews and if we go back to before that for the Islamic world in the year 113 uh, the Milano uh, decree of ending any kind of of oppression against Christians but the history is full of contradictions if we speak about Europe for example for long decades they used to wage wars uh, because of religions and ending with the courts of inspection and ending with this good diversity of languages it is important to look at history and to speak about these prominent notices and what is important for us is the present and the future and if we go back to the near future uh, maybe uh, five months ago and based on the uh, Muslim World League's efforts we have signed the agreement or the Charter of Mecca al mukarrama with more than 1,200 Islamic characters from all sects and all uh, different groups this indicates social religious and even uh, environmental diversity we are happy to have his excellency dr muhammad bin, Ab bin abdul karim al isa the secretary general of the muslim world league and also dr michael privet the establisher of the european institute of the islamic studies and the director of the european network against racism before we start, it is our pleasure to receive the ambassador of the European Union to deliver an opening speech in the beginning. Dr. Saud, uh, um Al Saud Sarhan, Secretary General of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, our wonderful and warm host, the speakers, um, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Alisa, Secretary General of the World Muslim League, Dr. Michael Privot, the founder of the European Institute of the Studies of Islam, the, 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 the research the director also of the King Faisal Center, welcome. To all of you, um, thank you very much for being here. It is um, for me a, a privilege to be, first of all, amongst friends and leading scholars with an impressive and long-standing experience in the field. We have, I hope today, very much to learn from you. And I want to really thank you for being here and for sharing your, your knowledge and, and experience. Um, on a more general note, um, we are working as the European Union to deepen our partnership with the King Faisal Center, and today's lecture is a starting point rather than an end in itself. And I think there are few more uh, fitting teams as exchanging on the Saudi and European perspectives of religious tolerance and diversity. Um, all of us know that the King Faisal uh, Center for Research and Islamic Studies builds, of course, from the legacy of the late King Faisal and has been a pillar in promoting Islam and its core values of tolerance in the kingdom and abroad. 
And we are particularly privileged um, to have here today the founder of the European Institute for the Studies of Islam, Dr. Michael Privot, who's uh, a leading European scholar in the field of diversity and inclusion that will enlighten our minds. His Excellency Mohammed Alisa actually does not need any introductions. He has been at the forefront of promoting religious tolerance and enhancing mutual understanding, which is at the core of the Saudi reform process. Many of us diplomats in the kingdom have had a privilege to witness and be part of this unique transformation process. Um, today's subject um, it has also a broader resonance. It touches at the core of the transformation of our own societies. In Europe, we have become ever more diverse. Today's European society is a mixture of culture, faiths, values, ideas, and habits. The challenge before us is to ensure we make our societies more inclusive, enhance mutual understanding, and promote tolerance and respect. I would like to underscore here that in all cont continents, there are people of faith who have chosen the path of respect and coexistence, not in spite of the, their faith, but because of their faith. Likewise, in all continents, there are secular people who recognize and understand the need to engage with all dimensions of society, none excluded, and that includes religion. In the same spirit of respect and as part of our one humanity, I think it's important that we connect first and foremost, first and foremost as human beings. Uh, back in uh, September, on the 6th of September to be precise, I was in Brussels and the EU High Representative launched the Global Exchange of Religion in Society. It's a new European initiative. She called it a sort of Erasmus for practitioners, civil society actors, in support of those that are working in faith and social inclusion and, and to connect these practitioners inside and outside Europe, allowing them to learn from each other. Uh, on coexistence among people of different faiths. And, and I feel that today's lecture is very much in the same spirit. It's all about cross-fertilization. And, and I would really welcome a Saudi participation also in future in our global exchange on religion so that uh, Saudi Arabia can share their own very unique and rich experience as bridge builders. Uh, I think I've talked to, <laughs> a bit too much because here we have some keynote um, speakers, um, and, and I look forward very much to the lecture and the follow-on exchanges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, we're eager to hear your speech. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praises due to Allah. Peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad, his family and companions. First, Your Excellencies, Your Highnesses, dear attendees, it is my pleasure today to have you with us in this meeting which is a meeting of culture a meeting for intellect and a meeting for communication it is a meeting for building bridges and understanding and dialogue in an important topic which has become one of the most important intellectual issues and cultural issues, as well as political and social issues as well in today's world. Due to the arguments around it, that this topic is tolerance. Tolerance is the value It is not an abstract value, but it is a, a restricted value. Restricted because 
in its Arabic translation from tolerance in English. It is limited or restricted by giving and interaction. This is how it is translated with the word tasamuh in Arabic. But if we look at the real true translation through the values, the Islamic and Arab values, we find that the true translation is not tasamuh, but it's as-samaha. Tasamuh is that you need something in return cooperation and collaboration and closely working together so the prophet peace be upon him said uh, may Allah have mercy on someone who was tolerant when he sells tolerant when he buys tolerance when he takes anything he didn't say tasamuh he says samh even if you're not tolerant with that person he will be tolerant with you so samaha uh, which is tolerance is a high value in Islam and the Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked, which is better in terms of faith? He says, patience and tolerance. This is a point that is related to the idiom or the term. So I do hope that we use the word samaha more than using the word tasamuh. Tasamuh is a virtue. But it is restricted and limited, not abstract like samaha, which is tolerance, closer to tolerance. Samaha or tolerance in Islam came out of the basis of the Islamic message for all. When we speak about tolerance in Islam, we're speaking about tolerance in Saudi Arabia as well, as a country that applies and follows the Islamic Sharia and uh, is proud of that. And as a country that did not agree to have a man-made constitution, uh, but they cho we chose to have the book, al the Quran, and the tradition of the Prophet as our constitution. So all of the things that we mention here, uh, considering as tolerance in the Islamic Sharia, all of these things that will be mentioned are considered also samaha or tolerance inside Saudi Arabia. The Islamic Sharia came with a big title named called Mercy. We didn't, Allah says to the, about the Prophet, we did not send you but a mercy for all mankind. Mercy here is not identified with an article they, and that means that it is all kinds of mercy. Mercy in the traditions and the instructions of the religion. Also, mercy amongst the members of society. Mercy with others, with the other. Mercy with the other religions, cultures, and traditions. Mercy in our civil legislations and also in the criminal legisl legislations as well. So all of the meanings and all of the uh, components of mercy are mentioned in Sharia. So uh, as a result of that, we have tolerance as tasamuh and samaha. So tol tolerance or for forgiveness is that we have uh, uh, to exchange uh, forgiveness with others, which is tasamuh, and also tolerance, which is the non-restricted uh, samaha, and this is a higher value. So mercy is a big title that has a lot of other titles inside it, a lot, a lot of components. So any intellect or any thinking or any civilization that takes care of mercy uh, is of no doubt taking care of uh, tolerance and forgiveness. Also, when we speak about tolerance and forgiveness, samaha and tasamah in Saudi Arabia and in the Islamic Sharia in general, we are speaking about something important, which is respecting the other. Respecting the other comes from, 
or starts from different starting points. First, respecting the human existence and the human brotherhood. And this wouldn't happen except with respecting diversity and as uh, something that no one can, that something that is inevitable. Allah, the Almighty, uh, decided that there will be a diversity amongst people. There will be variance and variant ideas, uh, differences between peoples, between civilizations and cultures. The problem is that some intellectual people, some thinkers, but I'd say some of the non-thinkers as well, We will not blame others. We will blame thinkers. Thinkers who did not understand that meaning. Uh, although they have provided some arguments or theses that are contradicting their conversation and their reactions and their ideas. There are some people who think that these cultures and civilizations cannot have uh, understanding or coexistence, uh, full coexistence. Maybe there is a partial coexistence, but they they will think that uh, there will no there will be no room for full tolerance and forgiveness. And they say that it is natural to have this civil civilizational cr uh, conflict and cultural conflict. And you know about Samuel Thierry who wrote about the conflict or the clash of civilizations. Samuel, I, I read his book and maybe he meant that uh, cultural differences and civilizational difference will, would not end and there will be no unity in terms of civilization and culture among all mankind but he describes that and interp interprets it as a clash or conflict maybe he mistranslated or misunderstand it or misinterpreted it but we will think of his good intentions and say that he may uh, did not know how to express it well so he used the word clash or conflict. Understanding others and accommodating their cultures is celebrated in Islam and it is considered one of the values, one of the ethical and behavioral values, especially because ethics are translated uh, in an effective way if they are behaviors uh, in terms of the words, in terms of the abstract Interact, interactions, but when it's a culture, uh, a behavior, and a constitution that encompasses a lot of ideas and cases, and especially with when dealing with others, this is considered a very high value in Islam. Also, uh, the His Excellency, the colleague, has mentioned a while ago at the beginning of this. Uh, session about the charter or the constitution of the Medina which is one of the one of the sources of pride for the Medina legislations in the whole uh, in the history of mankind this uh, constitution that was held between the Jew, Muslims and the Jews, it was binding for Muslims towards the minorities, the religious minorities. Uh, and this document, or this constitution, uh, spoke about uh, fostering the civil rights as well as the religious rights. In the details of this document, there are things that cannot be accommodated by extremism or terrorism. They try as much as they can to misinterpret these uh, ideas, but it is clear and it is easily understandable. So it is clear and direct, and this indicates that it is uh, true. And this uh, document is a great document, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, coexisted with everybody and they 
uh, and he understood the uh, way of God in terms of uh, the diversity and differences between cultures and religions. And he also spoke about a level of tolerance that is important until it is related to uh, total forgiveness. Uh, total forgiveness and total uh, remission of those who uh, renounced his charter and tried to kill him and he forgave them and he did not go after them and I don't think that there is a better model or example of forgiveness and tolerance more than that also If there were some misbehaviors from uh, some uh, people from Bacons and some people from other uh, religions, and Allah the Almighty ordered Muslims to have a dialogue and to converse, and that there is a wisdom in this dialogue, and He also ordered the Prophet that uh, uh, misconducts that do not respect. Uh, dialogue because they are uh, on purpose and they don't want to have the truth and Allah the Almighty told him if this is a vexatious uh, dialogue he ordered the Prophet peace be upon him to overlook them if they don't seek the truth and he also com compensated him uh, on regarding these regarding these things and he these offenses to not feel offended or to not feel as Allah the Almighty says in the Holy Quran that they would not be able that that they And he was, they will do you no harm, bearing a trifling annoyance, bearing a trifling annoyance. There are some things that are mentioned saying that the Holy Quran spoke about some of the religions and spoke about what happened in terms of sayings and uh, actions by some religions and the verses of the Holy Quran were strong and clear regarding these in terms of refusing what happened from some religions and condemning them and some people ask where is tolerance or forgiveness if this is the case some think that this is a stand against religion as a whole. But I, to be frank, some people say that the Holy Quran is full of verses that speak about Jews and condemn their actions. They say that this is a stand against the religion as a whole and this is a stand against what we are talking about in terms of values of tolerance and forgiveness. And I'd say the following. First, Islam and the Quran in specific did not take any stand against or contradicting to the existence of other religions. Never. The evidence is that Islam wrote documents, agreements, and charters on that. We had Sulh al Hudaybi al Hudaybi agreement, Al Medina document, and other similar cases. If Islam is against the existence of other religions, 
Islam wouldn't allow these agreements, especially in Al-Madinah document. The Prophet was in a, a, a status of strength and uh, the whole sovereignty and power was in his hands. And despite of that, he provided the high values that respect the existence of other religions. Uh, second, that all of the conflicts or disagreements that occurred and that all of the things that happened in Islam, uh, the Quran talked about, was speaking about specific sect or specific group, not all of those who follow that religion. Only speaking about a specific group that did some actions against the documents or against the agreements and those who uh, allied with the pagans to get rid of Muslims. So it's about part of those people, not all of them. And also as a proof of that, Islam respected their existence and also Islam called them to commit to the values of their religion. And he says, O oh, children of Israel, they are a a part of them, not all of them, because there were a lot other groups who were ally alliance who had alliance with the Prophet and they were very understanding with the Prophet. So not all of them, but some of them. So in the Quran So in the Quran it is said that it, it's the the verse said that some people among the people of the book are some who if entrusted with a hoard of gold will pay it back but others who if entrusted with a single silver coin will not repay it unless thou constantly stood demanding so the prophet uh, the slam provided for christians and jews a specific name that uh, celebrated their origins or religious origins he uh, the islam named them people of the book and used calling them all oh, people of the book islam did not remove their historical origins he called them people of the book and he provided them with a privilege in the in the jurisprudential uh, values Islam allowed us to eat their food and to marry from them and uh, women ha give birth to children and raise children and Islam allowed us to s to marry from Jews and Christians and to have children with them without any problem the problem is in a number of things the first is that uh, some people understand religion uh, through an an action that is odd, an odd action, or regular action by some people. Or sometimes uh, they judge religion by some writings that do not understand the true values of religion, maybe for misunderstanding or misinterpreting the texts of religion, or maybe because they take parts of the uh, texts and leave others. Or sometimes they don't understand the context, the historic context of some of the texts. So, what is required in this case is to have a strong, a good scholar. It's not enough to have an abstract thinker. We need a well-established scholar. I have met some thinkers from Muslims and non-Muslims who are interested in the uh, Islamic civilization and culture. And it is no secret that some of them were, some of them were on, were n huge, were hugely misunderstanding Islam. And some of them asked us to speak about what we said in terms of the, uh, clarifications and he told they some of them told us that this is a responsibility that we need to do in us a lot of cases the crisis now is a crisis of knowledge and it is a crisis of understanding a crisis of respect 
And when we say respect, we mean that this respect is preceded with a, an ethic, an ethical rule and a logical rule as well, like the things that we mentioned, which is respecting the method or the way of God in terms of diversity and differences between peoples and cultures and civilizations and religions. If we, if we are to review some of the uh, incidents that prove that Islam was forgiving and tolerant with all people, we will uh, take a long time, but I will mention a story. The Prophet, peace be upon him, married Sophia, and she, may Allah be pleased with her, she was from Jewish origins. Sophia, may Allah be pleased pleased with her, had money and she she commended in front of all Muslims that third of her money should go to her Jewish brother. And Umar ibn Khattab he was he, he had and, and this is mentioned in Al-Bukhari he, he had a board or a, a a piece of clothing that was given to him by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he gave it to his brother in Mecca to give him a message that the that the love continues and that Islam will only make him more celebrative and more affirmative and more uh, respectful for others. The Prophet, peace be upon him, one day entered and he found uh, the house of Sophia and he found her crying. He asked her, why are you crying? She said that a woman, one of the wives of the Prophet said so and so and so about me. She, she heard some things said by one of the wives of the Prophet. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, how can she be uh, better than you? You are a daughter of a Prophet, which is Harun, Aaron. And your uncle is a prophet, meaning Moses. And you are a wife of the prophet, meaning himself. And there was a funeral, and Muslims thought, uh, some of them thought that, or and concluded that the funeral is respected if it's for a Muslim. It was a funeral for a Jewish, and the prophet stood up as a sign of respect for that uh, funeral, for that soul that died, and out of respect that, they, that it is for a human being. It is not about tolerance, it is about a higher value, an ethical value. And we cannot reduce Islam to just a, a concept of one writer or one lecturer or at wit, at wit that was tweeted by a, a person or uh, an author or one analyzation or one analysis. We came across some writings by some of the Westerners and I am sure and I can swear by God that they do not understand even one percent of Islam and they dared to write about Islam. Before they start, they should have a dialogue, they should discuss, they should read, they should be aware. Some of them have specific issues that they think, they think that it represents a big dilemma for them and it means extremism. For example, they speak about not having uh, worship houses for non-Muslims in Saudi Arabia. And they ask, where is tolerance? And there were a lot of discussions about that. I will not speak about the details, but in a word, and of course this will happen later in the field of tolerance and forgiveness. 
the idea of having worship houses for non-Muslims, this is not an issue of 200 years or 300 years. It's in the whole history of Islam. It's not in these places because they are considered as uh, places that are limited to or private to Muslims or to the worship houses of Muslims. Uh, through the history of Islam in 1400 years until now, Muslims agreed on one principle and that even the different kingdoms or different em empires that ruled the region as a whole and ruled Iraq, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, the Levant and Egypt, they built churches and houses of worship for non-Muslims in Iraq, in Sham, the Levant, and in Egypt, but they did not put it here. This means that it is something that we agree on because it is considered uh, something that is specialized for Muslims. I'd like also to mention that the wise thing and the logical thing or people who are wise and logic logical look at the pros and cons the gains and the losses another thing is that the kingdom of Saudi Arabia so that given that it is something sacred for Muslims that nationality is for Muslims and people who come to the country, know the general uh, laws of the countries and things are clear. If we want to speak about this topic, uh, we'll take a long, a long time for it has a lot of details, but we, I wrote uh, uh, some, I published some writings about it and some people said that they are convinced. Some said that they understood, but they did not uh, agree. So I think understanding is okay. It is a kind of uh, closeness. Saudi Arabia is welcoming everybody. If there is any hostility against houses of worship for non-Muslims or uh, attacks against churches or synagogues, for example, we have condemned them officially if they happened. So we are not against the existence of other country uh, religions. We are not against the existence of other houses of worship, but we, the issue of having them in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is uh, is needs to be clarified, as I mentioned a while ago. Also, there were some exchange of visits between the religious leadership and political leadership. For example, some people who visited Saudi Arabia with an invitation from the Muslim World League and they met the, the second person in Vatican at that time, the late Cardinal Turan. He visited uh, Saudi Arabia and met the king and he was considered a high ranking or value of Vatican, the second person who announced the France, the honoring of Francis the Pope. And he visited Saudi Arabia and we signed an agreement with him in Riyadh, an agreement in Riyadh between the Muslim World League and Al Vatican, represented, Vatican represented by the uh, Pope uh, Council for Dialogue. All of our conferences outside Saudi Arabia are attended by all religions and one month ago there was an agreement, a historical agreement, a historic agreement with the whole meaning of the word. It was uh, by the initiative of the Muslim World League and it was signed in France. This agreement contains rules and articles that are very important and wonderful that reflect the essence of religious brotherhood, humanity, brother, human brotherhood, and the brotherhood of the family of Abraham. It was signed by 
the chief rabbi in France, in Paris, uh, also with the representative of uh, the Orthodox Church and the representative of the Catholic Church and the representative of the Protestant Church and also the representative of Islam France organization, they all agreed and uh, gathered on one table and they uh, signed this hysteric agreement and this was one of the initiatives of the Muslim World League carrying the values of tolerance, forgiveness, and coexistence, as well as dialogue. And this agreement will be activated through programs, mutual or joint programs all over the world uh, under the name of this agreement. <laughs> Also, there were some visits to uh, worship houses all over the world, representing the Muslim uh, peoples according to their uh, names and their uh, loyalties. We tell everybody that we are with them, we respect them, we respect their existence, we are not against anyone. Uh, there were also some visits with the It was a good agreement that was signed before with good components and there was also some other agreements that were signed in New York between three big Jewish independent organizations. We signed these agreements and they were very important agreements and all of them were revolving around the importance of activating cooperation and working on the m common grounds. And we always say that 10% of common features of humanity are enough to have peace and coexistence in our world. But what is the problem? The problem, as I said before, is that uh, is, lies in knowledge, understanding, and respect. Also, the problem is in listening to the messages from one side, not the other. The problem is in not conversing, in not having a dialogue, and being far from each other. We need to know each other so that we can understand each other. We wouldn't be able to understand each other without dialogue. We need to understand each other in order to coexist. I may disagree with you. I may disagree with my colleague. I may disagree with my son, I may disagree with my wife, but this does not mean that we will be enemies. It's their opinion. I cannot force people to follow my opinion. If we disagree with others, Allah created people. If people have another color or another opinion, this doesn't mean that I will be his enemy or their enemy. I do not. This does not make me hate them. Of course, we have met a lot of people in our dialogues, even the far right people, and some of them are our friends now because we reached understanding with them on the table of dialogue in a wise way. I also want Of course, speaking about tolerance in religion, and I also think that some of our colleagues and brothers from Europe know that Allah the Almighty in the Quran, uh, in the Quran said that said in the Quran says directly that let there be no compulsion in religion. And also he talked to the Prophet, telling him, for example, when the Prophet tried to convince people of, the, of Allah the Almighty, he said, uh, will you then compel mankind against their will to believe? Also, I'd like to speak about the issue of jihad, which is a very important topic, topic 
People said that Islam came with the sword telling people, be Muslims or we will kill you. Some people think like that. The real translation of jihad is to strive. To strive is to bear something to so people who study are striving people who work to earn a living are mujahideen they are strivers so the verses in the quran speaking about fighting all of them okay are followed by the word by the word of allah which is clear all of the verses that speak about fighting are followed by uh, the word but do not transgress limits for allah loves not transgressors also i'd like to mention another thing related to something that annoys some others speaking about how can you speak about tolerance while you uh, have for example uh, speaking about people as kuffar disbeliever Or a verse, for example, that says in the Quran that never will the Jews or the Christians be satisfied with thee unless thou follow their form of religion. Some of these verses that Daesh and other extremists uh, use them. The verse that we are speaking about, that never will the Jews or Christians be satisfied with thee, this verse is speaking about the Qibla, the destination of uh, of our prayers. Some people pray towards Mecca. Some people will pray towards Jerusalem. They wouldn't be satisfied with my destination and I wouldn't be satisfied with theirs. They mean our Qibla, our destination or prayer niche. So the uh, the Prophet peace be upon him uh, they will be satisfied unless you follow their form of religion or their Qibla. If I'm satisfied with your religion and you are satisfied with my religion, this means that our religion is one. There is no diversity. But the essence of diversity is that we are not satisfied with each other's religion, but we do coexist and respect each other. And we notice that Allah, the Almighty, says in the Quran, for example, Allah forbids you not with regard to those who fight you not for your faith or drive you out of your homes for from dealing kindly and justly with them. For Allah loves those who are just. This is clear in the traditions of the Quran. Also the word kuffar and kafir, uh, sometimes they translate it as infidels. It's not infidels, it's unbeliever. I don't believe in your ideas and you don't believe in my ideas and this is not a problem. Even Abraham, uh, when for Muslims he is considered the father of the prophets and he is sacred and he is respected by us as a prophet and as the father of the prophets and he t described himself that he is an, uh, an unbeliever he said that we do not believe in his uh, pagan uh, peoples and your review of the higher values of Islam with historic examples and temporary examples of tolerance and also that the uh, problem is with under misunderstanding religion through some writings. I ask you if you please take no longer than 20 minutes if possible. <laughs> <laughs> so that we have time afterwards for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. I will do my best. So, Ambassadors, Your Excellencies, um, ladies and gentlemen in your titles and qualities, good morning. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So, I would like to thank first the uh, EU delegation to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and also the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Sciences for their invitation to, to have that important conversation um, around um, the, uh, the issue of, of tolerance. And uh, one is not common uh, from an Islamic perspective and uh, also bringing together. Uh, the, the, the Saudi perspective, and here I will try to present a, Muslim, a European Muslim perspective uh, to the issue. So um, yes, it might not be uh, immediately uh, evident, but I am Muslim myself. I converted 26 years ago now. Um, I was also for a number of years the spokesperson of one of the largest mosques in Europe um, for about 10 years. Um, and I've been also working a lot 
on theology and the issues of radicalization, identity, but also mostly now Quranic, uh, Quranic studies. So this is based on, on that background that I will try to uh, develop uh, my question for today. Uh, and a number of my research actually are on how if Islamic theology uh, has not been so far, in my view, very efficient and um, empowering Muslims to include themselves uh, in pluralistic societies and therefore paving the way to the development of a toxic uh, imaginary, I think it's tasawur in Arabic, uh, an imaginary of self-exclusion and superiority that has been one of the building blocks uh, of Daesh, uh, uh, Daesh narrative. So I will try to give, a, a, well, it's a, it's a very dense speech, so I will use maybe concepts some of you are not familiar with, so bear with me, and uh, I hope that we'll have uh, a, a fruitful uh, conversation. And also, again, as a matter of disclaimer, um, these are some of my conclusions, and I, and I spare you the te technical apparatus, but we can enter into it uh, afterwards if you, if you wish so. Um, so, as the head of, of the uh, European delegation kindly, kindly reminded us, um, the European Union um, is characterized by an increasing diversity, uh, including in terms of religious and philosophical beliefs, notably due to globalization and secularization. And even from the Muslim perspective, nowhere except for Mecca, maybe, um, do we encounter such a diversity of ways of being Muslim, from a theological, cultural, jurisprudential, dogmatic, philosophical, or uh, ideological point of view. Any single Muslim group or, or community is represented somewhere uh, in Europe. And this situation puts European Muslims in a very unique environment, which is different from any other uh, Islamic majority uh, society in the world, where the Islamic diversity, intrinsic diversity, is therefore less extended than one we have in, in Europe, uh, even in countries such as Indonesia or Pakistan. And I think that this is the first time in history uh, that, for example, we have Muslim groups from Uzbekistan and Muslim groups from Senegal that are living together and trying to become a community together uh, in European secular societies. Um, societies uh, which have completely liberalized, if I can say, the market of religions and beliefs. All faiths and creeds are accepted as long as they do not... So, um, as I was saying, um, the European societies have liberalized um, the market of religions and beliefs, and all faiths and creeds are accepted as long as they do not endanger the physical and mental integrity and dignity of anyone, and of course, do not seek to take control of the state. So from the point of view of European states and populations themselves, in majority, all faiths and none, as well as religions, are equivalent. Religions cannot use anymore the coercive power of the state to impose any single point of view or doctrine by force as a result of the process of separation of church and states that started roughly at the end of the 18th century and is still going on to an extent in our societies. So to cut a long story short, Christians in particular, and Jews to a much smaller extent, had to rework uh, their theology so as to reframe their religious practice and the rem remit of what they could impose on society in terms of morals, of values, so that, it, so that this theology could match up with this new situation. So to be honest, and you know when it was reminded uh, uh, earlier, it has been a painful process um, with ups and downs, um, and the balance point has not uh, yet been totally found, um, if ever, uh, in particular as the social fabric of the European uh, Union is evolving constantly. And we, we see, for example, the increased percentage of Muslims and evangelists, to take a few in those uh, societies, is further tilting the balance point a little bit further. Um, so coming straight to our topic, what we notice as European Muslims um, is that, as Muslims, uh, we have not yet sufficiently reworked uh, our mainstream Islamic theology to be able to deal with the very diversity of our own communities first and our societies second. If you take any mosque, for example, um, even because of, say, a p most of Pakistani background, because it would have been founded by Pakistani migrants a couple of generations ago, 
you would have uh, in that crowd people that are conservative or the liberals, some men and women uh, that are married to Jews or Christians or Ahmadiyya or Sikh or atheists or Buddhists. You will have gays and lesbian Muslims. You would have born again Muslims of the third generation or fourth generation, Muslims that are on the verge of becoming agnostic or atheists. You would have Muslims who practice religion just by tradition. You would find Sufis, etc., etc. So from a traditional uh, Islamic standpoint, many of these people actually would not be even considered as Muslim and would not even be expected to pray in a mosque. However, they are there practicing. Some are extremely active members of their communities and they are striving to do the good of all, for the good of all. So can we just consider that they are cursed by Allah, uh, doomed to inferno, and are less than human beings as we hear too often, unfortunately, in our communities. Not to mention even uh, people from other religions and beliefs uh, other than the people of the book, as it was reminded earlier, the Ahl al-Kitab. So historically, we know that under the Abbasid Caliphate in particular, when the core elements of Islamic theology were developed, it, were, it was when Muslims were actually in a situation of political, economic, cultural, and religious domination. The various uh, theological and uh, jurisprudential schools reflected the fact that Muslims were at the top of the social and political ladder, in particular the free men, who were enjoying the largest extent of rights. On the contrary, people of other religions were theologically considered as people of a lesser value with the translation of the status into law, i.e. the dhimma, which was of course conceding certain rights in exchange of duties from the non-Muslims, but they were certainly not at the same equal status with the Muslim free man. And I'm not even mentioning the status of women and slaves. So further, in the Muslim society of that time, only the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, were given a status, uh, the mushrikun, uh, all the people not considered of being of a book, had no place in that society, were converted by force, and reduced into slavery, slavery or vice versa for their own sake as it was developed by uh, uh, the Fukaha. So religious diversity when accepted in that society was reduced to a very small circle. The people that had had the chance to be known by Muhammad وسلم, and quoted in the Quran, uh, reflecting the very limited diversity of a very, very specific place of the world, i.e. the Hijaz in the 7th century AD or 1st century Hijri. In a word, Muhammad had no clue that the Buddhists uh, ever existed, not to mention Confucius or the Zen masters. The shirk um, designated the beliefs of the people of Mecca uh, or the rest of the Hijaz, but not the people of the Americas, unknown at the time, Mongolia or even the Vikings at that point in time simply because the people around Muhammad uh, would not have understood what he would have been talking about if he had ever uh, mentioned them. And of course, in this worldview, atheists, agnostics, Hindus were absolutely not on the radar of the Quran, as such people were not existing in the society of Muhammad at that point in time. So when Muslim theologians now wish to refer to the Quran to say that God uh, praises diversity, they use the verse Al-Hujurat 13, uh, so you, you know it, Ya Hayyul Nas, Inna Khalakna Kum Min Dakarin Wa Unsa, Wa Jalna Kum Shuban Wa Kabail Li Taarafu, etc., etc. So the fact that uh, uh, God has created us from male and females and uh, split up us in, uh, or um, in, in, I will use the standard translation, nation and tribes, so that we can get to know each other. But this is, I would like just to compare the understanding, this is the normative, I would say the mainstream understanding, and what we try to get when we look at the Quran from a historical critical perspective. Um, the mainstream understanding, so proposed by the ulama, rests on a number actually of generalizations. So when we talk about an nice uh, the people, it would concern all the people on earth, past, present, future, whereas in the context of the Quran, it was the people around Muhammad, that's it. I mean, people of the Hijaz, basically. Shu'ub now would mean nations, in the sense of homogeneous human groups localized on a specific territory, whereas in the Quranian context, it was just meant large tribes, and Kaba'il were smaller tribes, okay? And when it comes to the term Ta'aruf, 
um, which is so often quoted. Uh, it was the, the <coughs> it was meaning in the Quran context the fact that tribes have to identify each other to be able to cohabit on a specific territory and develop alliances and agreements to avoid wars and hazwa, basically. And it was a key element of tribal life um, of the time. And today, it's just understood as getting to know each other or share uh, uh, traditions. Of course, it's understood in a positive sense, uh, but it does not provide any objective then. So any aim to this getting to know each other. Why should we not Araf? What for? I mean, uh, is it just to know each other and know that, oh, this is my neighbor and, we are, and, and that's it, and you stay in your corner, or just to avoid war or to make society? We don't know, okay? Um, as we extract the verse from its, from its context. And of course, it's always possible to extrapolate from this verse a call to the universal respect of the other, starting from a common humanity, uh, but it has a, the cost of uh, putting this Quranic verse out of context, uh, which was actually concerning tribal politics, uh, based on the importance of lineages at the time when Muhammad was trying to gather in his alliance uh, the largest number of tribes. This verse was not a universalist call to a shared human brotherhood. If some, of course, wish to use this verse as such, that's fine with me. I have nothing, I'm not opposing it. But we should not be surprised that it does not help to think what we can do with this uh, ta'aruf and how we can establish guidelines and theology and even maybe more a pact to live together. Um, there are a few other verses uh, that are often used when uh, ulama want to talk about uh, diversity, uh, the, the verse that are concerning an ummah wahida, or the verse uh, uh, that was here a little bit mentioned, al-Hajj 40, concerning the fact that if God had wished, I mean, he, well, he had put people against each other so the synagogues, churches, and mosques are not uh, destroyed. Um, so however, this context that is often used as a symbol of tolerance is... I think, in context, a bit of the contrary. It's, it's rather uh, pessimistic about uh, religious divergence. Um, and it's not in any case talking about religious diversity as we understand it today. It basically underlines <coughs> the fact that although in the uh, Quranic anthropology, there is only one way to save, uh, to save heaven, and this is the proper meaning of deen, actually. It doesn't mean religion. It means a way, uh, literally to go to a safe place, uh, which is a way that is clearly indicated by the ayat, the signs of God, so either verses or can be in a desert like a mountain or a specific dune or the color of the sand or you name it. Actually, in that anthropology, people can get lost if they wish. God has put the sign in the right path, but you're free to do whatever you want. If you don't want to follow the path, like ikra hafiddin, get lost yourself, no problem with this. So it's not really positive in that sense, yeah? Uh, but we have also to remind ourselves, uh, and here I would maybe a bit disagree with what was said before, that it is a society that is co depicted by the Quran that is a non-coercive society. There, are, there is no police at the time of Muhammad. There is no judiciary. There is no central state. There is nothing. So basically, there is no, nothing you can force people to do a thing that they don't want to do, basically, which, of course, will change later on under the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphate. These are completely different societies with a central power that is in a position to enforce a law or a religion or a belief or, uh, or whatever. So um, we w the Quran was addressing a, a group of people that was quite homogene homogeneous ethnically in terms of language, in terms of culture. Uh, even the Jews that are referred to in the Quran, the Yahud of Medina, basically these are the Jews of Medina specific, they were sharing culturally, linguistically, they were just the same and the other. There was no difference between them. Um, and the Quran was not, for that matter, addressing like globalized, uh, very heterogeneous uh, societies like Europe today or other places uh, of, of, the, of, uh, of the world. And of course, the problem is that a number, the, the mainstream theology has been carving in stone based on understanding of that specific book in transposed in an imperial context later on a number of regulations that we still are following one way or the other. So um, for me, uh, and this is what I, 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 I kind of, of course, we have the point of view that the mainstream Islamic discourse can be, in a way, some that follow. God wants diversity. It's a plan of, of, of God, in a way. Uh, and we need to be respectful towards one another, share, search, uh, and accept the divergence of, of opinion. 
But if this view can indeed appear tolerant, uh, we need to remind ourselves that this conception of diversity uh, has not seen any contradiction uh, with uh, the, its later implementation um, in a hegemonic worldview, at the top of which is, sits the Muslim, his place being divin divinely guaranteed, as, uh, as mentioned before. So in a very, so you can be tolerant, but in a very structured uh, society and hierarchical society. So how can we try to get away from this hegemonic paradigm that is still very much like transpiring from the Islamic theolo the, the mainstream current uh, Islamic theology to be able to navigate pluralistic societies as the European societies are today? That's where we need to maybe, as a theologian, then try to bring a number of elements together. So we have the principle of divine justice, Adla, which is a key in the Quran, basically. Um, if we believe as Muslim that, that God is infinitely merciful uh, and it has ascribed to himself the rahmah, the, the, the mercy, um, we have to think a little bit differently of how the way justice is reflected in the Quran, for example. Uh, the justice reflected in the Quran uh, uh, was in line with the harsh uh, living conditions of its time. It's a justice calculated for a tribal, segmented society. We think of the Qisas, for example, where slav slavery, just to mention this one, was practiced. Uh, but that was the society in which Muhammad was living and that God was talking to uh, through the Quran. And does it mean that what the Quran mentioned uh, is the best form of justice ever? Uh, does it mean that this justice of the 7th century, in one of the harshest places on earth, is the best manifestation of justice that mankind will ever be able to aspire to? Uh, can't we envisage that today the most detailed expression of justice is the corpus of human rights, including even the emerging rights of non-human living beings, as we see it today? For Western Muslims uh, in particular, I think we have to start from this framework, the human rights corpus, as our compass for justice. If God is infinitely just, it cannot do less or be less just, put it that way, than what its creators are managing to do by the sole exercise of their reason. Uh, and conversely, the more we understand justice that way, the more we understand justice in the Quran. So, I mean, that's a bit of a give and take. Um, and of course, uh, the consequences in terms of theology of this approach are huge. Let's be, let's be, let's be honest. Um, in a world steered by God, a God of infinite justice and mercy, what matters is how justice and mercy are implemented by human beings, by, by human beings with care and kindness. It's a world where no one is trying to impose their religion, their worldview to others. In such a world, some Muslims' obsessive quest for purity loses its relevance as the key to paradise and the hierarchy of values that goes with it uh, is completely uh, different, it's changed. That is, we've seen time and again that one's individual salvation as a Muslim is more important than even the respect that you have to, do, to, to give to the other. Um, so to put a, a basic example, if one is saved by the generosity of God and not because they have refused to sit at the same table than a wine drinker, for example, then we can share with the wine drinker a moment of friendliness, even if we will drink, as Muslim, another beverage. So what matters is here, the fact that uh, we share uh, in respecting the other and not we respect in avoiding the other, which is often the case that we see in European Muslim societies. Like we, we just, it's just like fragmenting the living together for fear of being drawn in something that can be danger, could be dangerous for you. But of course, let's be honest, sharing uh, always implies a risk, right? But if God is infinitely merciful, then it will forgive anyway, um, according to the very Quranic anthropology. Because what matters, what matters most above all, is the survival of the group, Muslim or not, by the way, until the final uh, house, the Akhira. And this survival, if we, re we read carefully the Quran, can only happen if we work collectively, sharing our resources in full respect of one another, with the view to agree on which direction to follow, the very meaning of deen, with the concept of, concept of shura, of tribal consultation that comes with it, with the view, of course, to reach that safe heaven. So, <clears throat> and I will come to my conclusion quickly. Um, as a consequence, we see that the, uh, the ontological status, because this is what is at stake, actually, of the so-called heterodox Muslim or non-Muslim other is 
concerned and is changing. So against the tide of the mainstream theological position that I just mentioned, the Quran depicts a society where tribesmen were encouraged to enter in an alliance with God and his messenger on the very same model as the tribal alliance, which was actually the anthropological horizon of the time. And this alliance was independent, and I insist on this, of what these tribes, tribesmen were factually believing of their religion. And here I would just like to mention something that is uh, really key in, in the, 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 the new perspective that social and, and, and critical sciences can bring to the understanding of the Quran. Um, we, the, the, the mainstream um, discourse on Islam tells us that Iman means belief, uh, but actually Iman, if we look at how it was, the term Iman and all what comes from that uh, same root, uh, rather means the alliance with God, the adherence to, to, to God. And this is why just, well, God can be a mu'min. God is not a believer, right? But he is an ally. He is someone I can be in extremely close partnership with. It's a very participative kind of relationship, right? Um, it's, I will not, yes. In that perspective, um, the Muslim is the one who seeks the protection from God and its messenger and not the submissive to God, as is too often understood today. And the kafir is therefore not the disbeliever, but the one that conceals the, the, the signs ayah of God. So it says like, no, don't look at those signs. You have to go another way, okay? So it has nothing to do with the fact of believing and what you believe uh, or not. And we have to remind ourselves that the, the root amana is used 879 times in the Quran. Okay, it's really massive. It's one of the most important concepts in that sense in the Quran, compared to 140 times for the, 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 the root salama. The, the term mu'min is used 202 times in the Quran against 39 times for the term Muslim. So obviously we see that the iman in a way and all what comes with it is much more important than and more, much more structuring the, 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 the Quran than actually the, 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 the root uh, salama, Islam, and all the derivative is actually doing. But actually, by interpreting iman as belief and <coughs> kufr as disbelief, past ulama have probably done what I think is probably one of the most tragic interpretation uh, of, of, the, of the Quran under the influence of other cultures and religions in other contexts than the society of Muhammad to which the Quran was initially addressed. And we see until today the consequences that this has when we look at the theology developed by Daesh, uh, for, for example. Um, so actually, when you look at this from that angle, uh, the, the society that the Quran is depicting is about building an alliance, Iman, and protection, well, Islam, uh, to build a society together without questioning the actual intimate beliefs of the Mu'minun. Okay, uh, and uh, that's where we see the shift that has been done, where past ulamas actually have proposed a structure of society, a, a, a structure for society based on the quality, the content, and the implementation of the beliefs, uh, which is actually total, totally absent from the Quran itself. Um, so, um, trying to cut then. Two more minutes, yes, I will try. Um, so what we, what we see, and, and this is very interesting, how Quranic verse like uh, uh, the Surat Al-Ma'idah uh, 69, in amanu wal-ladhina hadu wal-sabi'una wal-nasara, koma, men amana billah, so it means all the other, all those that have been in a pact, in an alliance with God. Um, uh, so those that have been in alliance with, with, with God and have practiced the good deeds will, never be, uh, will, will, will never be uh, uh, sad in the, in, the, in the afterlife. So we have clearly verses that are really building the fact that to be a mu'min, an ally with God, um, in, the, in that, in, in the Quranic times, it was not looking if you were a, a Christian or a, a Jew or, or, or whatever. So for me, it's absolutely possible to establish today, based on those Quranic principles, an egalitarian alliance open to all, whatever their philosophical and religious beliefs, including the most radical atheists, because this alliance can, can cater for a form of citizenship under two aspects. The one, of course, the legal belonging to a city, to a country, 
and second, the capacity of living together and doing things together independently of the majority region of the city, if it has any, and even more particularly in societies where there will never ever be anymore a majority religion, but a flux of a minority regions with more or less common features. So what establish actually the, 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 the alliance uh, is the desire for a common destiny, the desire to arrive safely, safely to protect and be protected uh, with the view to be able to develop and grow in peace. And that is was actually what the Quran was calling to, uh, if we uh, understand, it, understand it in its own context. The, the last point I was willing to do is also that, um, maybe very quickly summing up, um, is about this equality issue that we, we need to look into. Often, uh, the Quranic, the, 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 the mainstream theological discourse is about like, oh yes, uh, all humans were created equal. And we are using the, the verse Alest to, uh, of the Alast, uh, when this time, we, before the eternity, when God brought the all souls of all mankind and said, Alest to be rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And they said like, oh, of course, we, 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 bear tes uh, we testify that you are our Lord. So, okay, look, all human beings are equal. Yes, okay, that's in a way that's true, but this was before, but what, no, what, what about now? I mean, and this ver vision of uh, this, kind of protection to say that yes we, but we were equal has allowed even to even to naturalize afterwards the worst inequalities in this world right and so this is where a shift needs to happen because an alliance as i was mentioning can only happen among equals because we are living in the same nature the same ecosystem we are linked to it indefectibly so we need in a way to 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 consider ourselves as equals whatever our religion whatever our creeds our beliefs or non-beliefs and so forth so as to be able to forge this alliance so here i've been trying to say in a nutshell to 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 show how reading the quran uh, and being faithful to the text in that sense and to its philosophy and anthropology we can go beyond uh, what we have as a mainstream uh, theological discourse so far so far that is still extremely widespread in europe and we actually are not creating a new Islam whatsoever. We are just reopening doors that have been closed for historical reasons because people of the time made other choices, and that's fine, that's history. But if we are not condemned uh, or constrained by this history. We can always reopen uh, potentialities of Islam that were not exploited at that point in time. And well, thank you very much for your <laughs> patience. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Michael, for a very insightful and uh, novel interpretation of reading of many verses of the Quran, and for only taking five minutes more than the allocated time. <clears throat> I think we started five minutes late, so we will take five minutes more. So we have about 10 minutes for questions and comments from the audience. Uh, Dr. Abdelaziz. شكرا سمو الامير دكتور عبد الله على اعطائنا هذه الفرصه وشكرا لمركز الملك فيصل الحقيقه على منحنا هذه الفرصه للاستماع الى هذه المحاضرات القيمه. معرفتك العربيه القويه دكتور مايكل تغريني ان اتحدث بالعربيه ان ان اذنت لي الحقيقه. اعتقد انت اثرت مجموعه كبيره من النقاط يصعب علي ان اقف عند كل واحده منها لكن دعني اقف عند واحده فقط منها وهي الآية الكريمة يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل تعارفوا الحقيقة كونك تريد أن تبقيها في إطارها الزمني أعتقد المسألة ستقود إلى تساؤلات كبيرة على اعتبار أن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم هو أرسل للناس كافة ولدينا نحن أمة الدعوة وهو كافة الناس ولدينا أمة الإجابة الذين آمنوا بالرسول ولذلك الخطاب يا أيها الناس ولكل الناس من آمن ومن لم يؤمن والخطاب يا أيها الذين آمنوا للمؤمنين وأنت أشرت إلى قضية الإيمان في القرآن بشكل كبير لكن المسألة الكبرى هي يا أيها الناس ثم فالخطاب هو لا يمكن أن يكون فقط لفترة معينة لأنه أكثر الذين يتحدث عنهم الرسول هم من المؤمنين ولكن الحديث يا أيها الناس هو الحقيقة يعني يخرج عن نطان جانب المؤمنين إلى جانب أكبر ثم الشعوب والقبائل كل من حول الرسول في ذلك الزمن كانوا قبائل الحقيقة فتفسير أن نيشنز وترايبز قبائل صغيرة وكبيرة أعتقد نيشنز أعطت معنى متسع ربما في الوقت الحاضر على اعتبار صلاحية القرآن لتفسيرات متعددة عبر الأزمان يعطينا هذا المعنى الجديد ثم أنا أعتقد أن التعارف بحد ذاته أنت تقول تتعارف ثم ماذا التعارف ليس قيمة بحد ذاته 
لكن ما يقود إليه التعارف هذه هي القيمة التعارف سيقود إلى التفاهم ثم سيقود إلى التعاون ثم سيقود إلى التسامح وهذه هي القيمة الكبرى التي نحن نبحث عنها فالمسألة الآية لم تفصل بشكل كبير على اعتبار أن قيمة التعارف ستقود إلى أشياء أخرى شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا هل هناك سؤال آخر نأخذ سؤال آخر قبل الإجابة دكتور رشيد هنا لو سمحت و... ليس السؤال وإنما فقط است... توضيح يعني أنه إحنا المشكلة الآن يعني اللي ندوة الآن اللي استمعت لها وكل الندوات اللي تحصل أنه عبارة عن إعادة تفسير يعني تعريف بالبدهيات يعني ونركز أنه على نصوص التسامح هذا جدا صحيح ولكن ماذا عن النصوص الأخرى ماذا عن الكتب التي تملئ الأسواق والمكتبات في العالم الإسلامي الكتب التي تنفي كل ما تكلمنا به الآن إنه هذا كله منسوخ ومعروف هذا وهذه مركزة يعني أنت سلآن من يأتيك متطرف وتريد تناقشه أنت تعطي لا أكره في الدين هو يعطيك آية أخرى تعطي حديث هو يعطيك حديث آخر فالمسألة إحنا صحيح كأننا اكتشفنا الآن أنه أطر التسامح أطر كذا الموجودة بالنصوص القصة ليس هذه القصة أنه كيف أنت الآن تعزل هذه الأجيال عن ما موجود من تركة ثقيلة من الكتب والتركة الثقيلة هذه يعاد طباعتها بشكل غير عادي أنت الآن أنا أشوف الموقف حتى الدكتور مايكل يفسر لنا الآيات وكذا وهذا ممكن للأوروبي يسمح يكون جيد بس بالنسبة للناس الآخرين اللي عارفيها جدا يعني ما يراد لها توضيح ولكن هذا هذه الآيات هي, هي مفسرة عند آخرين وهي مركزة جدا وأنا أقول لما نريد نتكلم عن هؤلاء ليس مسلمون ليس مسلمين هؤلاء ليسوا مسيحيين هؤلاء ليسوا يهود أنا أشوفه هذا التجاوز على على الواقع يعني إحنا الآن ما لازم نتعدى الخطوة الدعائية نتعداها إلى خطوة عملية لأن بين مفترق طرق أما أنت تذهب بالتسامح ولازم الحقيقة تتوضح وأما أنت تظل في المسألة المسألة دعائية فهذه أنا أشوفها أنه هذا بس صرف جهد ويمكن هذه لفترة معينة وتنسي أو تجي تطلع الأشياء الأخرى من الكتب فتاوى ليست الفتاوى رسائل الفقهاء عند كل المذاهب عندنا أنا أنا بس أريد أوضح أقول هل في قتل للمرتد في القرآن ما موجود هل في قتل هل في رجم في القرآن غير موجود وهو إعدام أيضا هل في قتل للساحر في القرآن غير موجود هل في قتل للساب الذي يسيء أو يشتم في القرآن غير موجود ولكن هذه موجودة في كتب الفقهاء وموضحة حتى الناس لما تريد تتكلم لهم أنت تقول لهم ما موجود في القرآن يستغرب يقول لك كيف مش موجود في القرآن شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا كنت أتمنى أن معالي الدكتور موجود معنا ليجاوب على سألتك لكن أحيلها للدكتور مايكل What do we do with the many verses in the jurisprudence books that are not about tolerance? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, so I will take the, the two questions in, in order. So, um, th so the one of, okay, the challenge that we have, uh, the, the two questions are interrelated, uh, um, uh, actually, and thank you for, for, for asking them. Um, what, what's the starting point of uh, my endeavor and of many others with whom I'm working is that if you look at um, Islam, for example, like uh, like we know today, 
Um, and specifically after Al-Qaeda or Daesh and so forth, you had the numbers of uh, refutation of, of Rad uh, that were done like uh, the, the Risalat al-Baghdadi and many others, just to name but a few, some extremely detailed, okay, saying like, okay, jihad and so forth is not part of Islam, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, it's, it's very well written and according to the Islamic sources and everything, but it does not work. It does not work because you have in front of you people like I've been looking at the fat fatwas of Daesh, for example, as an example. They, they, they wanted to justify, rightly so, what they've been doing um, to co try to convince the Muslims, the rest of the Muslims, that they are following uh, uh, the Sunnah with Sharia. Okay? They are using the same verse, the same hadith, they are quoting the same ulama from the, uh, from the, from the past centuries than the tradi to the, the, what you would see the Muslim mainstream ulama today from the four schools or even the Sufis. So if you are the Muslim lay men or women on the street, how can you know who is right or wrong when they are using the same sources, the same methods and go to completely diverging results? Okay, so it's it's impossible to so we have an issue and this is what we call in a um, there is a term uh, that is called pharmakon uh, co coming from the gr the, the Greek um, ancient Greek that is uh, Islam it's it's a tool it means it can be reverted each way so um, you you can do something good with it like uh, with a poison you can kill someone but you can also heal someone this is the basic of a pharmakon what I see today is that Islam as it's being has been developed over the last say 13 centuries or something like this, developing its own internal uh, knowledge and validation processes and so forth is, for me, and this is my personal judgment, uh, is not anymore able to be that pharmacon, to be able to produce its own antidote against its own, de uh, its own uh, uh, extreme uh, 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 derivation. So the point is, we have to provide solution. What I'm providing here is I'm not claiming any kind of solution, right? It's just like entertaining the debate for us collectively uh, try to, to challenge ourselves on trying to find new ways. So what we are trying to do uh, is increasingly um, using the um, historical and critical sciences that are bringing new, sometimes not extremely new uh, knowledge, um, uh, and try to go back to understand the Quran in its own context so that we first try to limit the scope of misinterpretation, okay? Um, we had some examples about the uh, the kital or about uh, about jihad uh, and so forth, and that would need uh, definitely uh, uh, pages and pages of, of of explanation. But at least that we try to understand. Okay, that that was was how the Quran in its own context was operating. Then we can decide. Okay, that's something that was for its time. We can leave it. Uh, that's something that we can maybe a principle that we can take from our time if we take again it's easy the, the principle of justice so how how do we how do we go from from here to there like cutting hands in that and at that point in time was the most extreme that you can do we can move to something else now we are not constrained by this part this this realization of justice in that specific time we can probably move to something different Okay, so I know it's a huge debate, but I think that these are the kind of consequences that, that we get. And it's again, for example, why we try to, to come to understand what it means. And Nas were the people around, uh, around Muhammad, in our view. Okay, and indeed, it doesn't say, Ya Ayu al Mu'minun, it says, Ya Ayu al Nas. So he was even reaching beyond the people that were, according to us, in his own alliances, which is very good. But it's just the persons on that specific territory at that point in time that Muhammad could know. I mean, there was no point for him to talk to the people of, of China at his time or to us people that he would not even know that it would be existing like Muslims in, the, in, in, the, in Norway or above the pole or whatever, okay? To, 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 to give just an example. My point is, you have first to understand the context and then you can make a an individual choice, and that's what's important for me, an individual choice about the meaning that you want to give to a verse or to a specific word. If today you think that an nas means all mankind, I'm fine with you, but don't say Islam says. I say nas means humanity, okay? And that's a very big difference because what we have too often is ulama, learned or not, uh, extremely good or not, that are just saying, or the layman, Islam says that. Okay, final word, end of the conversation, and then you go in all direction. But if you say, my understanding of Islam today, based on my knowledge, is this, then I can challenge. Then we can have a conversation. And then I'm absolutely fine if some people say that Ta'aruf is the basis for Tasamur. 
agreed. But let's understand that it was not the initial meaning, probably, in the Quran, it's an hypothesis, and in that very specific Bedouin world uh, that, that we have. And I agree with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hayoum. Um, yeah, of course. We, we, but the, uh, we need to go to actions. But at some point, we have also to understand that we need both actions, both thinking. We need people that are also bringing new frames uh, and, and others that are at the forefront of trying to influence people on the web, like we heard yesterday. Uh, all of this needs to, to, to go together because, for me, we are engaged in a, in a culture camp really, a, a, a fight for culture, a fight for the heart of Islam. Um, and therefore, I, I think that it's, yeah, probably we could forbid some books in the, in, in the, in, in, in the bookshelves. Um, probably it might help, but most of them are already on the internet. You will find them very easily. So I think it's, 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 it's better to try to have this kind of conversation, even if we completely might disagree with our path, with our theological approach, with if we use the critical sciences or not, and so forth. That's open for debate, but at least we, we move. And what I see, and I would really bring this testimony from, uh, from the... Uh, I think that yes, in Europe we have the chance to have really to be to be pushed to be pushed very hard as Muslim. Uh, some might regret it, but I think it can be some sort of a rahmah or a mercy uh, that we are put on the spot to really get self-critical and to look at our legacy and our heritage, to go back to the Quran, to go back to the Sunnah if we want or whatsoever, and to the book of the of, of the of the of the ulama. Uh, and what I see actually is that we have an increasing number of Muslims um, that are really uh, questioning all in all directions, that are not satisfied with the mainstream theology that, is pro that has been proposed for the last 40 years, basically. So I, 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 I think that these are the kind of, this is our public, this is the people we have to talk to and that would be convinced by this approach because they are just not satisfied with the way that uh, the, the, the prophet said do this. No, sorry, I, I just can't buy this one anymore. I mean, that's, that's too easy, yeah? But how, what can we provide and what kind of new and this is the real challenge and this needs to happen and it's not the, 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 the effort of one man one woman or one group is how we try to shift and build a new islamic episteme can i say that in a way uh, that would be much more universalist and inclusive than what we had before and and that is departing uh, from the way islam has been traditionally learned thought has become a self-referencing system okay but that is increasingly challenged by the discoveries that we have, like uh, uh, in, 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 the, in about the formation of the Quran, the development of the Hadith, and so forth. At the moment, Bukhari is good, but you will have to be. To f the fact is that Bukhari is not enough anymore. It's increasingly challenged. Will be even more challenged. So what do we do? We just like push this away, or we say like, as a Muslim, I I, I need to make sense of all of this, and 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 that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Thank you.